Welcome everyone to this symposium on interprocedural monitoring and the application of a new novel non-invasive technology to measure blood flow. Today I'm joined by several esteemed faculty, um, Dr. Peter Monteleone from the University of Texas in Austin, myself, uh, Eric Scott, a vascular surgeon at the Iowa Clinic, uh, Dr. Greg Stanley, a vascular surgeon from Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Dr. John Winscott, an interventional cardiologist at the University of Mississippi in Jackson. Welcome, gentlemen. These are our disclosures. And as for today's program, I make note that this is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP global company, and it's graciously supported by an educational grant from Medtronic. There are three learning objectives for our symposium today. The first of which is to really understand the current landscape of non-invasive testing and to discuss the need for interprocedural monitoring as we work in the catheter lab. The second objective is to discuss the latest new laser speckle imaging technology that's used for non-invasive interprocedural monitoring. And lastly, it's for all of us to understand this new non-invasive technology that it's available and when to utilize it to the best of our uh, patient outcomes. So I wanna start just with a brief introduction to this challenge that I think each and every one of us face in the catheter lab on a daily basis. And that is interprocedurally, how do we know that we've achieved enough increase in blood flow to a limb or a foot that we can successfully stop? And that's, that's always been the challenge. I point to this particular case. This was an 84 year old patient of mine recently who presented with ischemic rest pain and early digital gangrene of the right second toe. And on her diagnostic angiogram, there was no aortoiliac disease, but on the left, you can see a high grade mid to distal SFA stenosis, more distally an occlusion at the, at the adductor canal with complete occlusion of the popliteal artery and only single vessel runoff in the calf via the perineal artery. And I think the challenge in cases like this is that we all know the SFA lesion will have to be treated, the femoral popliteal segment recanalized, but ultimately at the end of this case, we wonder, will that perineal artery alone be enough to provide sufficient blood flow to the foot to heal, or will there be additional intervention required? The ideal monitor of blood flow would be multiple things, I think, if we start sit down and think about it. We want it to be predictive of things. So whether it's wound healing or alleviation of rest pain, elimination of claudication, we want it to be predictive of outcome. But more than that, we want these technologies to be simple. We want them to be accurate. It'd be great if they were continuous and provided real-time data in the midst of our procedure so that we could use it at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the, of the procedure. And better still, if that data provided could be actionable by us to determine whether more needs to be done or whether we've finished the case based on previous intervention. So I think it's kind of ironic then, if you look at what we have in the catheter lab today for real-time monitoring, and we do get data points in real time, right? So we measure the EKG, we get real-time data of heart rate, we can measure the blood pressure continuously, we get continuous pulse oximetry, we monitor all these things, but not our target organ, the foot. That, to this point, has always gone unmonitored. So when we look at existing technologies and assess the utility of the data they provide, I think on one end of the continuum, the far left is angiography, two-dimensional grayscale angiography, which can give you a sense of blood flow at the minute, that point in time where you inject the dye. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a technology that could show us an immediate improvement in tissue oxygenation would be the ideal, but we're not there yet. But the, perhaps the next best thing though would be a, a device, a tool that could in real time give you a sense, a measure of volumetric flow. And that's where we're gonna focus the discussion today on this new technology using laser speckle imaging. So at this time, I want to welcome Dr. Greg Stanley, from North Carolina to present uh, the initial uh, introduction to this new technology on laser speckle imaging. Welcome, Greg. 
Thank you very much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present um, and be a part of this interesting discussion. The FlowMed device is a novel device um, that allows feedback within the catheterization lab for monitoring during the procedure itself. And it does this by using laser speckle imaging. And essentially a laser light is transmitted through the entire digit. And the camera on the other side of this obtains real time uh, feedback and imaging through the high speed imaging sensors. And you can see the pictures depicted here as the laser light is reflected off of the tissue and the red blood cells running through the tissue. Um, essentially a peripheral flow waveform as well as a volume average flow can be plotted over time. Uh, based on the data that's obtained from the laser. And there's two things that are displayed on the device um, as this data is being obtained. And the first is the flow waveform, which you can see across the top of the screen here. And essentially, the, this reflects the real-time changes in blood flow during the cardiac cycle. And we can characterize these waveforms as either normal or abnormal. In addition, the flow value uh, can give us uh, information on how much blood flow is flowing through the digit at any particular time during the procedure using a calibrated number scale. The sensor is attached to uh, the digit uh, similar to how one might attach a pulse oximeter in uh, clinical use. And essentially these sensors obtain this data and transmit it through a cable to the tablet interface the adhesive wrap uh, around this uh, sensor is designed in a way to keep the sensor in close contact to the digit and reduce any artifact uh, that might come during uh, motion. So essentially this is real time data that is processed by the CPU within the tablet and uh, again shows the waveform uh, as well as the flow value throughout the course of the procedure. There are several different displays that can be shown throughout the procedure to focus in on different parts of uh, the data that's being obtained. The tablet is shown here um, and again uh, has both the waveform and a flow value. You can see on the right hand side of the display there is a, uh, a fuel gauge which sort of gives us a sense of a combination of this flow value as well as the waveform uh, analytics to give us an idea of is this a, a positive good waveform? Is this a good flow value? Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more of that here in just a few minutes. Ultimately, this is a non-invasive sensor. It's very simple to set up and simple to use with data that is easy to interpret. So let's dive a little bit deeper into each component of what's displayed here. Essentially, the velocity waveform uh, shows us whether the blood flow in the digit is normal or abnormal. We all are familiar with the different phasicity of velocity waveforms, triphasic, biphasic, monophasic. We all understand that the presence of vascular disease alters both of the waveform and the flow value. So taking what we know about velocity waveforms, especially distal to areas of stenosis. So if we place this sensor on the digit, we are at the farthest most region from the heart and therefore any stenotic disease above that or proximal to that is gonna change the waveform. So as we move from a triphasic to a biphasic to a monophasic signal, we will see changes in the waveform in terms of the amplitude, the phasicity, and even the wavelength. The blood flow value is then plotted over time and an average blood flow value can be displayed on the screen, which goes into the number that's displayed. Behind the scenes, the CPU is also processing information, including, as we spoke about on the last slide, physicity, the slope of the upstroke, and also the width of the waveform. All this data is then combined to give a sense of how good and how much the blood flow is within the digit. So if this were to be plotted on a chart throughout the procedure, we could see, of course, that we would expect to move with our interventions from a monophasic to a triphasic type of signal. And we would also expect our flow values to increase throughout the procedure. So in essence, if we plotted this on a chart, we would wanna move from the lower left side of the screen to the upper right side of the screen. 
In a previous study that was presented at AMP in 2019, Dr. Rizavi uh, looked at 167 limbs uh, using the FlowMet device and correlated the data that he obtained to current testing methods of ankle brachial index and toe brachial index. And again, using the flow value um, that was obtained based on the volumetric flow, as well as the uh, analysis of the waveform, and a flow met index was created and compared uh, to the ankle brachial index and toe brachial index. And you can see those scatter plots posted here. Each of these showed a direct correlation that was statistically significant with the ABI and the TBI, showing a tighter correlation with the toe brachial index as might be expected as the sensor is placed on the digit. So as we get more familiar with this device and use this device and specifically become very familiar with the waveform changes that are shown uh, with the pulse uh, volume uh, amount, we would expect over time that we could become familiar enough with the device that we should be able to um, show a correlation between better patient outcomes with improvement in waveform, as well as uh, an increase in flow value. Now, of course, these numbers are not hard and fast and every patient's gonna be different, but a change in waveform uh, based on phasicity, uh, the rise of the upstroke, et cetera, are things that are physiologically uh, analyzable. And we can use that feedback during the procedure to help us make decisions um, and receive feedback in addition to the angiographic pictures that we're obtaining. Furthermore, um, the snapshot view allows us to compare different time points in the procedure. So as we first attach the uh, device to the patient, we can take a snapshot of our procedure start um, as we do different interventions throughout the procedure, we can see how what changes take place, not only in the waveform, but in the flow value. And each one of these can be toggled um, to capture these different time points during the procedure for direct comparison as we progress from the beginning to the end of the procedure. In addition, all of this data can be recorded throughout the procedure. Uh, if you'd like to record it from the very beginning to the very end, it will capture all of that data and it's saved on the device that can be downloaded or um, presented later for analysis. There is a built-in analyze function within the device that allows you to plot the data throughout the procedure, both in terms of the waveform changes and the flow value numbers and can be plotted nicely. Um, this is uh, some perhaps practical applications to upload these information and data to a, a medical record system. Ultimately, the FlowMet device is a very simple setup. As you can see depicted here, this is exactly how the setup is in my lab. We attach the tablet to an IV pole that's well within sight and um, very few components to this. Uh, so it makes it a, a completely easy setup and uh, very non-invasive as well. Well, thank you, Greg. That was a, a great introduction to this new device. And I appreciate all the technicalities that you uh, interwove into this. Can you just give me a sense of your first impressions of this device when you had it in your lab from an ease of use? How long does it take to, to get out of the box, to set up? Is it logins and passwords and it's ready to go in 15 minutes or, or is it simpler than that? Because it seems to me like it's a really sensitive measure of blood flow and I, I haven't seen anything like it. I would completely agree with you, Eric. My uh, first experience with this device uh, was actually in my clinic um, and I put it on my finger. You essentially turn the tablet on, plug it in, put the sensor on your finger, uh, start the display and you immediately have a sense of uh, blood flow in the digit. Um, it is extremely easy to use, it's uh, intuitive and it, it's so neat to watch. Um, so doing things like an Allen's test on yourself um, gives you a sense of how accurate um, and sensitive the device is. You can watch the blood flow diminish to a flat line during your Allen's test and watch it come right back as you let go of your wrist. And uh, I had several staff members walking up to me uh, in my clinic, just begging me to allow them to use it because they wanted to see what their blood flow is like. So, so it's absolutely easy. Um, and once you become familiar with the display, um, it really provides valuable information um, uh, during the procedure. Peter, I think, I think you've had the opportunity to use this at your center as well. What were some of your first impressions? 
Well, you know, it's especially for use of an intra-procedural device. Um, whenever you're starting with something new, there's always thoughts and concerns that you're going to be slowing down cases or, or adding another thing that has to be interpreted. And in reality, it's the exact opposite. I think as soon as you get this device on, as soon as your cath lab team uses it for the first time, they see how user friendly, how straightforward the setup is. It, it really, it's, it's really quite intuitive when you get started. I had the exact same situation the good Dr. Stanley described for the first time I, I saw it, I immediately put it on my finger. And just when you're talking, you know, the changes in intrathoracic pressure, you see a change in blood flow. So it's remarkably sensitive, um, but at the same time for use in inch procedural, it, 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 you really, you can figure it out as soon as you open this thing up. And obviously not just for the person, you know, the, the interventionalist or the surgeon, but that's so important for the entire team when they're there, seeing it for the first time, using it with different operators for the first time, very uh, quick and easy and, and just makes sense as soon as it's on and in place. Have, have either of the two of you seen it uh, predict trouble in, in cases when you might not have otherwise anticipated it. Have you had cases where this device tipped you off to a flow problem when you didn't otherwise know it? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. I can comment on that. I had a case uh, not too long ago uh, where the flow met was in place and we were making progress. The patient had uh, tandem lesions in the SFA, and then also had uh, tibial perineal trunk disease uh, right at the bifurcation. Um, and uh, essentially, we opened up the proximal SFA lesion, tandem lesions, um, with an improvement in blood flow seen on Flomet. Um, and then as we started approaching the tibial disease, um, in the process of doing angioplasty, both the posterior tibial and the perineal artery, um, there was a piece of plaque sitting right at the bifurcation. And as we balloon, there was plaque shift back and forth between the two vessels. And obviously in this patient, the, um, the posterior tibial artery was the dominant vessel. So as that plaque shifted from the perineal to occlude the posterior tibial artery, uh, the flow met um, uh, essentially uh, monitor, um, we saw a, a significant decrease in blood flow in the digit at the time, which certainly was um, not something that could be left behind. So um, I intervened sure. on that uh, with atherectomy and had an outstanding result, but, uh, but certainly something that uh, could easily be missed. Sure. Dr. Winscott, I think you've had, you've had experience with this device in your lab as well, and I suspect you've, done, you've had numerous cases monitored with it. I'm just curious, how do, you, how do you choose on a foot which digit to put it on? Does it matter? Are any of the five fair game? And, and how, have you, how have you come to decide? I think in especially my CLI patients where um, you have a specific area of the foot that you're targeting, an angiosome, so to speak, of the foot, um, I'm very interested in the relationship of a digit that's a good target for the sensor um, and its relationship to that wound. Um, you know, wounds on the forefoot, you can, you can choose very nicely where to do that. Wounds that are not on the forefoot, you have to kind of decide based on, I actually decide based on the angiogram, the angiographic angiosome that's closest, the, dark, the digit that's closest to that angiosome of that. So if it's a heel wound, I might look and see if any of the toes have a common uh, vessel with the heel. Um, you know, if the, if the lateral plantar supplies the fourth and fifth digit, that might be my target for the sensor because I'm really interested in the flow in the calcaneal branches of the posterior tubular artery. So if obviously if there's a wound on, on a toe itself, the sensor on that toe or the toe right next to it, I think is the most appropriate um, way to do that. And hopefully and possibly in the future, we may have sensors that can be placed in other places on the foot that are not necessarily have to be placed on a digit for more specific situations where you're concerned about perfusion of a part of the foot that doesn't have a digit attached. Well, with that, with, thank you, John. With that, with that answer, why don't I turn the microphone over to you? We'll bring up your slides and I think you're gonna take us through some cases. Absolutely, thank you. And so what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just introduce you to one of my patients and how we use the FlowMet system to monitor him during a procedure and to make clinical decisions. 
This is a gentleman that presented to my clinic. He's 68 years old. He's got multiple medical problems, including coronary disease, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, but his most severe comorbidity that is affecting our procedure is his COPD. He has actually been on four liters of home oxygen for the last nine to 12 months. He cannot lay flat. He sleeps in a recliner at home. And our best case scenario in the lab was going to do, was going to do the procedure with him propped up on a wedge um, on his home oxygen. He presented me with severe ischemic rest pain. He was very miserable. He was actually contemplating amputation just for pain relief because it was felt that he might be too high risk for any type of revascularization procedure. His ABI was 0.3 with very low amplitude monophasic waveforms, almost a flat line waveform. And he did have a very flat line toe pressure. When he first presented to me, he actually had very severe disease in the left common femoral artery, which was gonna be our access uh, vessel for treatment of the right lower extremity, which was the, the extreme was giving him the most trouble. So we actually had to come in two weeks previous and treat the left common femoral with directional atherectomy followed by drug coated balloon just to give us a place to access in order to come over and treat the right lower extremity. So baseline imaging of the left lower extremity, you can see the common femoral artery is patent. The profunda femoris artery has its main branch occluded and there's high grade disease in the SFA, but it is patent. But when we get to the popliteal, you can see that the popliteal occludes right at the P1 segment with a fairly complex proximal cap with reconstitution just above the joint line in the P2 segment and what appears to be a patent P3 segment on this initial angiography. However, when we get below the knee, you can see that there's actually complete occlusion of the distal popliteal in all three proximal tibial vessels. This is all a series of collaterals that reconstitute the perineal in the mid calf. Fortunately for the patient, the perineal does go on to the ankle fairly disease free after the mid vessel and supplies some fairly robust collaterals into the foot. And on our initial angiography, you can best see the posterior tibial artery reconstituting above the calcaneus and then appearing to proceed on into the foot. So just in summary, our baseline angiogram, his common femoral artery on the left is now widely patent. We treated that with directional arthrectomy and followed by a seven millimeter drug coated balloon the previous week with a good result. He has an occluded profunda, some disease in the SFA, but patent complete occlusion of the P1 segment with reconstitution of the P2 and P3 segments, but then severe below knee disease with occlusion of all three tibials proximally and reconstitution of the perineal artery in the mid calf, which then supplies the foot. So in, just as we've been discussing all night, our baseline flow mat value, this is placed on his great toe is basically a flat line waveform. There's very little phasicity, if any, um, to the waveform with a value of less than five at, at 3.2. And what the computer is doing is, is showing us a, an overall value down here in the red, which is obviously not a surprise to us. This is a patient with severe ischemic rest pain, a very low non-invasive test of ABI with, with monophasic waveforms, um, and then angiographic evidence of severe hypoperfusion as well. So the plan, um, this patient is on a wedge, so I'm not actually gonna give him any sedation. We're gonna do all this with just local lidocaine at the, at the access site. The primary target for this procedure is gonna be the popliteal occlusion of the seven French 45 centimeter crossover sheath. We're gonna try to cross the CTO anagrade because obviously with the tibial disease, the retrograde options for this uh, CTO of the popliteal are pretty much non-existent. So we're gonna come down with a, a trailblazer catheter, a support catheter down to the proximal cap and do a selective injection. And you can see this is a fairly complex proximal cap with a side branch collateral coming off right at the distal edge of the cap, which makes it, make it difficult just to, to find where you need to penetrate the cap and to locate the actual lumen of the vessel. So the way we chose to do that is, is engage that cap with an 018 nitinol wire. This is the nitrix wire. And once we were able to do that, we were able to push the 035 support catheter over that wire, get it to form a tight loop. 
And once we did that, we were able to proceed in what appeared a good trajectory and felt like we were in the lumen of the vessel. You can see as we approach the distal cap, we're just gonna continue along that same direction where we like the trajectory here. We're meeting a lot of resistance. If you watch my hands, how hard we're pushing the catheter and looping that wire, that tight little wire, that 018 wire, um, just to get it, try to get down to the distal cap. Once we approach the distal cap, we stop to take an angiogram just to see exactly where we are in relationship to the trajectory. And you can see here, we really like where we are in this view. We're headed straight at the reconstituted P2 segment, but we were unable to penetrate through that last centimeter um, with the loop. So at this point, we chose to switch to a very stiff wire. This is the 30 gram tipped in tear wire, the stiff in tear wire. What I've done with this triangle is showed you exactly the shape of the distal cap at the reconstituted segment. And you can see I'm just gonna blunt dissect through that area with this stiff wire until I get the wire into uh, the true lumen. And I can tell that it's, it's, it's in the true lumen just by the tactile feel of the wire. And of course, the appearance of the screen that the tip is free. And you can see now we've entered the true lumen um, of the reconstituted segment there. Once we did that, we had a little bit of difficulty getting support catheters to follow. So we used an 014 Corsair catheter over that interior wire to cross through that distal segment that was so difficult to cross. Once we were able to do that, we could deploy our spider filter, our embolic protection device in the P3 segment, taking care that it's above those collaterals, making sure we're protecting all of those collaterals that then supply the perineal artery at the mid calf. Once the spider is deployed, we then took our, our atherectomy device. This is the, um, the Hawk 1LX device. We were able to dotter through that segment with the, uh, with the catheter without having to predilate. What I like to do in this case is once we get through the occlusion, pull the catheter up and then take an angiogram. And because of the dotter force of the, of the device, it's, it creates anti-grade flow. So then you can make active educated decisions about which direction you want to remove plaque with the atherectomy cutter. And so you can see we've done that here. This is a, the angiogram after uh, the daughter and you can see there are several areas that we would like to remove tissue, remove plaque with the directional cutter. And I'm gonna play this for you so that you can um, hear exactly what's going on with the device. Screen left, we're gonna make that cut. So you can hear the device, the pitch of the motor. Again, this device spins at 12,000 RPMs, and as it hits resistance, as it hits calcium, you will hear that blade decelerate. And so that's some of the auditory feedback that you'll get from this device. One thing I really like about directional atherectomy that's unique is that this particular device gives you lots of feedback. And so you notice that we're shaving with the blade facing screen left. So I can actually watch the blade interact with the, with the uh, plaque. Make sure it's holding its line through the plaque and not bound. So once we completed our atherectomy part of the procedure, we followed that up with two of the Impact Admiral drug coated balloons um, to maintain the lumen that we've created. And you can see on our final angiography, we have a really nice result with excellent lumen gain, brisk flow and through the entire FEMPOP segment. And most importantly, in this patient situation, we were able to preserve all this collateral flow to that perineal artery, which you can see here reconstitutes very nicely. And you can see much more brisk flow into those collateral vessels that fill not only the posterior tubular artery, which was the vessel, only vessel we saw in the initial angiogram, but also now an anterior tubular artery, which had previously been hibernating, uh, but now shows up very nicely on the completion angiography uh, following revascularization of the popliteal segment. So you can remember the flow met value at the beginning of the case was 3.2 with a flat line waveform. Now, once we've completed revascularization and removed the embolic protection device with excellent flow into those collaterals, we now have a flow value of 21. And even some of those waveforms have a biphasic appearance to them with a diacritic notch, but you would not expect them to be triphasic 
because we do not have straight line flow to the digit and in fact have collaterals at the level of the of the proximal tibial vessels which lead to a perineal which then supplies the foot through a second series of collaterals. So it's quite amazing the flow value we're getting here with just revascularization of the popliteal segment. In this patient who has high risk for staying on the table very much longer, we were able to complete this procedure very quickly. And the flow mat told us that we've done an, an excellent job of, of improving the flow in the leg, which in this patient proved to be predictive of his clinical course. And so his ischemic rest pain completely resolved. He did very well. He did not uh, develop any tissue loss in that limb. And actually, amazingly, um, he actually came off of home oxygen about six months later, was able to participate in cardiac rehab and pulmonary rehab and has done much better. And in fact, uh, after a, a year after this procedure uh, was having some angina and came in for a heart cath and I convinced one of my partners to shoot a picture of his leg while he was in there one year later. And you can see one year later, we still have a widely patent vessel in the fempop segment. And I don't have the entire angiogram here, but he still had those very robust collaterals in the proximal tibials and at the ankle. So that's just an example of how the FlowMet uh, system monitored this patient, this high-risk patient, uh, throughout his, uh, his procedure, gave us very objective data that we had adequately um, reperfused his foot to the point where we could we were able to feel good about leaving the table, having not established straight line flow to the lower leg. And it was in this particular case was predictive of his clinical course. Eric, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, John. That's a, that's a great case. Um, difficult, challenging, complicated, one year follow to boot. Um, very interesting that you were able to capture that with FlowMet. And I'm curious in your patients with critical limb ischemia, what, when you put those patients on the table and you put FlowMet on to begin the case, what types of flow values do you typically see? Do you see much variation in waveform or is it predictable to you what you're going to see now having done multiple cases with it? Well, in patients who have true ischemic limbs, which in my population of patients oftentimes have spontaneous gangrene, and in patients with that clinical scenario, their value is almost always less than five. And the waveform is either completely flat line or very low amplitude monophasic. Um, in patients who have other forms of ischemia with tissue loss that may not necessarily be spontaneous gangrene, and that could be a trauma to the foot that's not healing, such as an ingrown toenail or a wheelchair injury or something like that or a venous stasis patient where the venous stasis ulcer is the etiology of the wound, but the ischemic limb is the reason it's not healing and actually puts the patients at high risk for compression because if you compress a, le a leg that's already ischemic, um, it only makes things worse and not better. And so in those patients, you see a little bit of variability, but I have seen a correlation uh, with my non-invasive testing with duplex and with ABIs which gives me the confidence to feel like if I can monitor that intraprocedurally, then it's going to be predictive of what I'm going to see uh, later on when I repeat their non-invasive testing in the lab. Yes, John, I think that that coincides with what I've seen um, in patients with critical limb ischemia in my lab as well. It seems like I, when I first put the device on a toe, I'm looking at numbers that are 1.5, 2, 3, waveforms that are often flat. Dr. Stanley, is that, is that what you've seen in your experience out in North Carolina as well? Yeah, Eric, a very similar experience here. Um, you know, across the board, patients have uh, flow values that are less than five, very flat waveforms, or, you know, very low monophasic uh, signal. And um, it, it is just remarkable to see um, the consistency in that um, across patients. Um, and, and I will just say, uh, Back to Dr. Winscott's case, I, I really think it's um, remarkable how the feedback can help you um, make decisions in the case. You know, the classic teaching, especially in patients that have critical limb ischemia, is that we want to establish that inline flow through the tibial vessels. And seeing the change in waveform and the flow value during that case 
um, and the feedback that that gives you about the work that's been done during that case um, tells you, especially in this high risk patient, um, that w we really accomplished quite a lot, even though, you know, it's not the classic teaching. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how this feedback um, changes what we do in the procedure um, and sort of uh, may even challenge the classic teaching uh, and revascularization. All right, Greg, are you confident enough in what you see with this device yet that you've actually gone to that next step where you're, you're, you're relying on this data and you're making clinical decisions to either treat or not treat, do this, do that, based on what you see here, if it's good enough or not good? Yeah, that's a great question and really cuts to the core of, of what this device is. Um, I will say that, you know, currently a lot of this data is still uh, just being applied in a case-to-case -case basis. So what I'm learning at my site and using this device um, as I go is helping me to make decisions as we go in the future. Um, I will say that the, the data that we get, especially the waveform data, is extremely valuable. I um, mean, going back to the, the part of the talk that I gave and sort of the analytics of that waveform, the waveform can give you so much information because it is so sensitive to what's going on with the blood flow. So even those changes in the slope or the phasicity um, become very obvious as you get more familiar and use this device. So particularly in patients that have critical ischemia, I wanna see the absolute best waveform that I can and if I take an angiographic image and it looks pretty good, but I'm not seeing the same thing on my flow med, it just makes me question, do I really have all the disease treated that I need to treat for this patient? And in that situation, I may switch over to another uh, form of imaging, another modality such as IVIS or, um, or even additional angiography pictures that I may not have taken in a different situation. No, oh, absolutely. Peter, in, in your experience down in Austin, have you, have you used this device in the setting of uh, treatment of claudication patients? Do you have any thoughts about how, how, how it can be used in that setting, the types of numbers, the changes in waveforms that you see in that patient subset? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're actually going to, we're going to talk about a couple of those cases just coming up, but uh, claudication, one of the, again, a classic teaching point is we're always quite thoughtful about Claudicant patients, the decision to revascularize, how much to revascularize, how aggressive, how many risks to take to at the end of the day, improve kind of a quality of life metric. Um, oftentimes we're so reliant on pre-procedural non-invasive testing when we make the decision to treat a patient with claudication and the ability to match that up closely uh, with information that we're getting in real time at the time of the procedure lets us make some really kind of thoughtful decisions about what we're doing to, to help people and also not putting them at any unnecessary risk. And we'll be talking about a couple of those cases as we go. Well, with that, why don't, why don't I let you get, get started then in the cases that you have to present today using the FlowMet device? I'll let you take it away, Peter. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Scott, so much. And, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Again, my name is Peter Montaleone. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Austin, Texas, and I'm going to be shooting through a number of different cases here, uh, rather rapid fire, focusing a little less on the procedure done to revascularize and, and a little more on some of the independent decisions that we make along the course of each of these revascularization procedures as we go. It's, it's fun to see how similar the thought processes are among the panel as we think about what we're doing um, in interventions without procedures. So uh, to begin, you know, we certainly have all been doing endovascular revascularization cases without real-time perfusion monitoring, without the FlowMet device. And it's, it's fascinating to think about how many independent decisions we make based on kind of the limited angiographic data that we have. You know, this was a case in an individual who, similar to one of the cases we saw earlier, had multiple different anatomic lesions in the setting of presentation with really severe rest pain in the, in the lower leg. Uh, we see here diffuse proximal and mid-vessel superficial femoral artery disease. We also see lower right at the adductor's canal level, a complete total occlusion of the distal SFA entering into the popliteal artery. Fairly obvious by angiographic information alone to proceed with revascularization at these two levels. 
Um, initially, we, we crossed simply that non-occlusive SFA disease. It was treated with chocolate balloon angioplasty followed by drug-coated balloon therapy. And then we proceeded to then intervene and, and cross the, the adductors canal popliteal segment total occlusion. That was done, as you can see in these images, with the Viance crossing, crossing catheter, followed by a nitrix wire that was then advanced. That allowed for placement of a spider embolic protection device at the very distal edge of the popliteal, just above the level of the trifurcation of the tibial vessels. We proceeded with treatment with directional atherectomy using the Hawk 1M device, followed by drug coated balloon therapy. So, so many decisions made already. You know, we treated that SFA, the question of how completely that was treated, the question of continuing down to the popliteal segment, all fairly obvious. But then again, there's more disease as we've seen. In each of the cases presented at multiple levels. So as this demonstrates, there's a level of a, a, a total occlusion of the posterior tibial artery. Continuing to progress beyond this in a case where we don't have any real-time and uh, non-invasive monitoring besides the angiogram, you'd be making decisions about if you have to keep going. Now, certainly this was a case uh, in someone with rest pain and with kind of complete inflow revascularization of the SFA and popliteal, we might decide to stop. But if there's a focal lesion located somewhere downstream of the tibial vessel, you can just imagine how helpful that uh, alternate monitoring of actual tissue perfusion can be. And so in a world with tissue perfusion monitoring, like we get from the FlowMet device, I wanted to run you through kind of a number of different types of scenarios that we've come across even in our early experience. So the FlowMet device has been demonstrated, gives, uh, it's worth mentioning yet again, just how simple it is to actually use. The, monitor is clipped onto the digit and you get immediate feedback with regards to that flow value as well as that flow waveform, simple to apply across a wide variety of cases. Starting with a simple classic case with a single angiogram, a total occlusion of an SFA, similar to what we've seen. And we can see a dampened, depressed, monophasic waveform, a flow value of 16.5. This was a claudicant patient with an SFA occlusion. And so we crossed that total occlusion again with the Viance crossing catheter. We did multiple rounds of directional atherectomy followed by drug-coated balloon therapy. And we saw a really robust angiographic result. No surprise that this person's claudication is gonna improve after we fix the inflow within the SFA. But having that ability to utilize real-time tissue monitoring gives us even more information. We know that there's no flow-limiting dissections that were present. We know we've had no distal embolic issues as we've worked. And we've seen a, just a dramatic improvement in tissue perfusion in real time just by dealing with that total occlusion of the SFA. So kind of a classic bread and butter case. No surprise tissue monitoring would improve when an angiogram improved this much. But not all anatomies are this simple. So what about a quote unquote less severe case? So this is yet another patient who came in with claudication, claudication that was profoundly lifestyle limiting. This was an individual who could not do their work, their job, which required quite a bit of working in the field of, of delivering packages, because all of a sudden they had this disabling left-sided extremity claudication. The angiogram's not terrible there, but like any, any proceduralist should do when we're thinking about evaluating these patients, this isn't the first test that we had. This is a person who had an ABI that was depressed, particularly an ABI with exercise that was significantly depressed. We also had a duplex ultrasound that showed at the level of the prox proximal superficial femoral artery, pretty profound flow acceleration on their spectral Doppler. And when you look at that angiogram, sure there's a lesion there, but it's not a terrible lesion there when you just look at it by angiography alone. And when you start thinking about treating this, you wanna make sure before you've left the lab that you fix the thing that's actually gonna help this person walk better. We did a very focused intervention on this, which was in fact a heavily calcified lesion, including atherectomy and a drug-coated balloon to prevent stenting in that segment. There's a little small area of dissection that you can actually see there, but when we look at the actual tissue perfusion improvement, it's dramatic. It's actually almost more dramatic than we saw in the SFA occlusion when you look at that flow value. This person's symptoms resolved completely, and knowing that we were targeting a less angiographically impressive lesion, but had tissue perfusion monitoring that demonstrated that benefit, and also showed us that that small area of non-flow limiting dissection truly was not hemodynamically significant, led to us stopping here finishing here, sending this patient out of the lab, we then had a complete resolution of his lifestyle limiting claudication and was able to get back to work. 
other cases, there's always this classic question, you know, many of us have gotten kind of more and more aggressive in, in, in our old age as we've worked on some of these procedures. And, and there was questions previously when we fixed inflow into lesions, if someone had two vessel runoff, we might ask, well, is, is two vessel runoff enough? You know, we, we train thinking about the angiosome, but sometimes if you had wide patency into two vessels, you think about that consideration. This was an individual with a non-healing wound and they had a digital non-healing wound. Historically, many of us have thought about toes as being watershed territories perfused by multiple vessels like we see on an angiogram. But as mentioned, with, a, with a, this patient with a non-healing wound on the toe, we saw this kind of single digit flow value and a depressed waveform in the setting of purely an anterior tibial occlusion. Now there is reconstitution, as you can see there at the level of dorsalis pedis. And even though that's the only lesion, that, that AT occlusion, we targeted that and we targeted that aggressively. We worked retrograde, we crossed, we opened it up with uh, angioplasty alone, acquired three vessel runoff. And you can see how pronounced that improvement in the flow value was directly to that digit. With the toe wound, we had the ability to put that monitor on the digit directly next to the kind of pronounced toe wound. And, and remarkable that that flow value increases so dramatically from just fixing a single tibial vessel. Um, it also lets you know that the mechanism by which you're fixing it, you know, we're working via retrograde access. There's a period of time where there's a sheath going retrograde. As a result, there's some concordant vasospasm spasm that happens in that area. And then we're working to actually open up the flow. And you can see with real time monitoring a really pronounced um, uh, improvement. Uh, extremely important when we're thinking about some of these complicated decisions that we make when working below knee. There's also this other question in more complex situations, this, do we have to get to perfect? You know, we love to get to angiographic perfection. We can't always necessarily get there. And uh, the next case is just a incredibly complicated case. So this was someone who'd actually come in with acute rest pain in their leg, but they'd had like 12 prior interventions. They had a fractured stent sitting in their SFA. They had, they had an old coronary stent placed in their distal popliteal. They had thrombus in the middle. And initially the thought was, well, is this an acute thrombotic limb in the popliteal segment? This is someone whose family member actually drove them from their other hospital to Central Texas, where we met them when they were first brought in after they were told they were gonna lose their leg. They had severe acute limb ischemia on top of non further revascularizable limb ischemia. And they started with a flow value of nothing on the toe. We thought initially this would be thrombus and we'd be able to pass thrombectomy devices and lysis catheters into that area, remove the thrombus and have a nice result. Instead, what we found out is this was someone who actually had diffuse adductors canal through P3 segment disease. They, some uh, prior operator hadn't been able to push the stent all the way down. So they pushed it as far as they could, they deployed it, and there was still heavily densely calcified disease distally with stent on both layers. We did our best in this situation. We wired down, we were able to cross, we did some undersized angioplasty to create a lumen that allowed us to actually try to get removed some thrombus. We actually couldn't pass anything else besides undersized balloons. So we ended up using some directional atherectomy just to try to debulk thrombus. Now that image that you can see on the far left is far from a perfect image. We did, however, have real time tissue monitoring that actually showed a significant improvement. Now I'll mention like a lot of these cases, this was someone that came to our lab with a creatinine of 3.2. So someone who is not on dialysis, but was on the verge of dialysis, we use as much carbon dioxide angiography as anyone. And when we acquired this result, we paused here and we thought, okay, let's pause. Our tissue perfusion has improved dramatically as we've seen by flow met monitoring. Let's see if the rest pain is gone because that's really what we were targeting. We stopped our case, we hydrated in post-procedure, and immediately after a vascularization, despite residual disease, which we didn't have a great option to make that angiogram perfect, going through a couple of fractured stents with dense remaining calcium, poor runoff that would make us not want to put any more stent there if we could avoid it, this person's rest pain was gone. And you know what? This is the second case I ever did with flow meds. This was a case that was done about two and a half years ago in someone who continues to be doing very well and had no recurrence of his rest pain. Thankfully, this has remained patient. You know, we could talk about the medical therapy that we've used to try to avoid any further occlusive disease, uh, but real-time uh, tissue perfusion monitoring in this setting, let us think about what we've been able to accomplish in the midst of a incredibly complex procedure and a patient that's incredibly high risk because of that renal dysfunction. 
you can ask more questions. You know, I'm an interventional cardiologist. One of my close colleagues and partners here is a vascular surgeon like those represented on our panels. Um, Dr. Tish Pedro Teixeira here in Austin has used this for some of the surgical cases. And it's really quite remarkable to see what happens when you perform aortofemoral bypass, for instance. So this was a case where aortofemoral bypass was completed. And immediately post-procedure after clamp release, you see a robust improvement in tissue perfusion. And, and I don't have to tell anyone on the panel, you know, with things that can go on during surgery where you're not necessarily watching kind of immediate continuous angiograms, the ability to demonstrate that patency is really quite remarkable. Now, also tissue perfusion is a physiologic measurement and not just an anatomic measurement. And it's quite impressive to see what happens as you get endothelial function after clamp release. So on that left leg, we had before clamp release, at clamp release, and then five minutes after clamp release, as you start seeing kind of improved perfusion getting into the level of the limb. Seeing those numbers, we have so much to learn from this. You know, tissue perfusion is not just something that we're going to be using in our cases. It's something that's going to help us better understand our patients and better understand our decision making as we go. You know, the last case that I'll mention is something, you know, where we think about this even in a world beyond PAD and PID in isolation. So soon after recording live cases, uh, utilizing Flomet for severe PAD and critical limb ischemia and claudication. We actually did a, a case in a patient with cardiogenic shock who also had severe PAD and required a left main uh, intervention. And so in this situation, we used Flomet not to measure our revascularization, but to monitor severe PAD in that limb. Now there was severe distal disease. We had an eight French sheath working into the coronary as we did a left main reconstruction. And it was quite remarkable to see that our perfusion actually improved dramatically before sheath was placed after a sheath was removed. And it's, that has to do not with opening up arteries. If anything, you know, we had a needle puncture into that artery and a closure device post, but the fact that we improved probably contractility and, and, and cardiogenic shock in this situation actually showed us improvement in the limb. So we didn't see malperfusion secondary to the sheath. We actually saw the clinical sequela of improving cardiac contractility and function. And it speaks to the fact that tissue perfusion monitoring gives us not just anatomic measurement, it gives us physiologic information that really helps guide our decision-making in some of these most complex of cases. And so, uh, you know, with that, I'll stop there. Thank you, Peter. That was an excellent presentation. And it really covers a, a much broader spectrum of application of this device from endovascular to open surgery and beyond. So I want the audience to know that Medtronic is actively investigating the, the utility of this device in all sorts of in clinical settings right now surrounding uh, peripheral arterial disease, but also going back a step just to study the healthy population because we have a sense of what this device should reflect in healthy individuals, but we haven't proven it, we haven't documented it. So at a few centers around the United States, this is being studied, there's all sorts of data being actively collected such that hopefully within the year, I think we have a much better sense of what normal looks like and what unhealthy, what peripheral arterial disease looks like as measured by FlowMet. But I'm, I'm interested in what each of you think about this device as an intra-procedural monitor, because I think we've all shown cases of the before and the after. This is what the, the value was or the waveform was before the case and after. I'm one of the trial sites. I'm blinded, if I do cases with this, I'm blinded to what's going on minute by minute through the procedure. But can each of you speak to what you're sort of seeing as the case goes on? Because you're, you're getting a real-time barometer and, and I'm, I'm curious as to what you see throughout the extent of your case and how helpful that can be. Or is it just before and after that you care about? I can start there to continue, Eric. You know, it's one of the amazing things about it is the fact that you can couple your pre-procedure information that you get from the device with your intra-procedural information from the device. So there's really nothing else where you could see a patient in clinic, get a measurement, take that measurement to a catheterization lab or procedural suite and follow that same information throughout the course of revascularization. So 
commonly it's, it's quite reproducible when you see someone in clinic and when you start your case, you know, then as you're, as you're dealing with blockages, you'll start opening them, you'll see improvement, you'll revascularize completely, you'll see kind of robust improvement. And it's just so quick, you know, it's, it's the same thing as when you put it on your hand and, and start talking, say, say you cross a subtotal lesion, as soon as that balloon goes up, you see that number drop down to nothing. As soon as that balloon comes down, you see that number improve. Then you take your device out and you see it improve even more. You know, there's definitely a, a change with endothelial function and dysfunction where you'll then see some kind of later term after, uh, you know, over minutes after you've revascularized and blood flow is improving and you're maybe either eliminating some of that vasoconstriction or getting some post-procedural vasodilatation. You see that change, but it's, it's quite remarkable to be able to take someone from the clinic through the start of their procedure through their revascularization, and then also have the ability to check post-procedure in some of these cases. So I, I, I'd say all along the course, you see the data you would expect, but with, with additional gained insight along the way. John, sure. Greg, do you, do you use these devices interprocedurally some surprises sometimes? So I'll just echo what Peter just said. And what I really enjoyed seeing in, in the first you know 30 or 50 patients that we use this device in the lab was you know, the individual delta in pre and post intervention and not just the numeric value of flow and not just the waveform by itself, but to use those two things together to try to assess just how much we have reperfused the lower extremity and to give that not only real time, but I think part of your question was, do you use that real time or in a snapshot? And I think that the most important value is right before you finish and, and deciding if you're done. So as balloons go up and down, as atherectomy devices go in and out, as embolic protection devices have debris and capture those debris, which obviously is a hindrance to flow. Once those devices are removed, especially the embolic protection device, that's when you start getting a real feel for where you are now, as opposed to where you were at the beginning of the case. And then you can make some, I think, more educated decisions than you were previously making using just angiography, sometimes intraprocedural pressure measurements using end hole catheters to try to determine if, if you've uh, still got residual disease that need to, needs to be addressed or need to address a, a moderate lesion that you, you're trying to decide if you need to treat or not. You know, we're in the process of just collecting enough data on that to decide where those endpoints need to be. We're not there yet, obviously, but I think in each individual patient, you get a really good feel for how much delta has, you know, what the difference is in perfusion pre and post revascularization. And as Peter mentioned, the ability to then monitor that patient post procedurally and longitudinally monitor them over time to make further decisions on that patient. Yeah, I'll add one more thing, um, which my, my experience has been very similar, uh, John's as well and Peter's, um, which is just remarkable. And, and it really excites me and it excites my cath lab staff when they watch these changes. I would say the learning curve is, is very flat. Uh, it's so intuitive. But as you do more procedures and become more familiar with the data that you're interpreting from the FlowMet device, it truly is a, a learning experience speaking to all the things that the physiologic changes that Peter was speaking to earlier and a person with an inquisitive mind and a little bit of imagination. There's, there's no telling where uh, something like this can be applied. And in my institution, we've used it in all sorts of situations that are quite literally um, only limited by your imagination. Um, I've used it in the trauma setting. Um, I've used it in ECMO settings. I've used it in large bore settings, uh, also interprocedurally. It's just quite amazing. It's so sensitive. It's so uh, intuitive um, and can give you so much information uh, to use in combination with, with other tools that you have available to you. So it's just a, an extremely remarkable device uh, with a ton of applicability uh, and also a ton of potential. I'm glad you brought those things up, Greg, because I, I think that really speaks to the the usability, the user friendliness of this device, because you're, you're saying you can take it to the trauma bay, you can take it around the hospital. It's just the, the tablet and the probe, right? 
That's exactly right. I mean, it's a, it's extremely simple. You know, we we have ours in a in a big case that's very easy to carry around. But it but at its core, it is a tablet and a sensor. It's lightweight. It's extremely movable, as easy as a Doppler probe is to carry around. Honestly, um, but sure. it gives you so much more information than a Doppler probe. Peter, I want to get back to something that you had said earlier which was to bring up the post-procedural aspect of surveillance of patients with PAD. Are you finding that these patients, there's pretty clear correlation with the types of flow values you left the catheter lab with, and they show up two to four weeks later with similar values that you see? They are, yeah. Hopefully. I I have seen that in, in my practice. And it's just, it's so incredibly valuable to have that information. You know, when we think about the metrics that we use for monitoring patency and completeness of revascularization, you know, uh, clinically driven TLR, target lesion revascularization, all these things, there's nothing better than a tissue perfusion monitor. You know, and the ability to say, this is what it was before we started, this is what it was when we finished, and we're still there. So there's nothing better than tissue perfusion monitoring. The, the ability to know that the revascularization had accomplished its goal and that uh, not just vessel patency, but tissue perfusion has still been accomplished, particularly for critical limb ischemia. There's, there's nothing more important than that goal and this allows for that to happen. I know our time is limited and I wanna thank you all for your participation, but I wanna, I wanna close with one question for each of you. And that is, I want you to take a minute and think about what you think is the most valuable application of this device currently, the thing that you've been most impressed by with FlowMet, that's the question. And I will, I'll I'll start this off and then I'll let each of you finish. But one of the things that strikes me about this device is that not only can it tell you when you've done a good job, but I think it also has the potential to really alert us intraprocedurally problems. And I actually used it in a case today where I saw exactly that. I, it was an SFA recanalization. I got a market improvement in the waveform and the flow value. We had a filter still in place. I took the filter out and on final imaging, I had a little angioplasty work to touch up in the popliteal artery. And I inserted a six millimeter drug coated balloon, did an angioplasty. And after that balloon dropped, my waveform went flatline. And that was completely unexpected. And I'm not, uh, you know, we're not used to immediate feedback that's not predicted and is in the opposite direction of what I was hoping. But that flow mat had picked up on something I couldn't see, which was a mid tibial artery embolization in a patient with single vessel runoff. And it took a nice waveform and it made it flatline. And that was the first indicator that something had acutely gone wrong at the tail end of my procedure when it wasn't filter protected. And so I think of other things. I think of the instances where our filter baskets might be filled. I think of the instances where a sheath intended for tibial use is actually occlusive of an SFA lesion and we didn't know about it. It seems like to me, not only can this device highlight the positive about what we do, but it can be an alarm when we're getting in trouble too. And for me, that seems like it'd be something really valuable to have in every case that I do. Dr. Stanley, I'll let you go next. Thanks, Eric. Um, I I think for me, what's most valuable about this device is if we look back at the presentation that you started with, uh, in terms of all the options that we have out there to monitor patients, what comes back to me as most valuable about this device is the quality of the data that you can get in real time. And that sort of leads to all the other qualities that make this device uh, really great. But the slope that you showed with all the different ways to monitor tissue perfusion, um, when you realize that this device is actually combining two different types of data into one, being volumetric flow and waveform data, uh, it's not just a single piece of data, you're combining those pieces and it makes the data more robust in my mind and more um, valuable. And I inherently trust that more as, as a scientist, right? The more data you have, the better. And so I trust the more data that I have um, when applying it to the current knowledge that I know about the physiology of the peripheral vascular system. That's an excellent point. Dr. Winscott, final thoughts? 
I think we've uh, made this point several times, but I think the aspect of this particular technology that's most attractive and will be attractive to the masses is ease of use. And just the ability to get this type of data with very little setup, no risk to a patient and portability. And so in my situation where I take care of a lot of uh, critical limb patients that are very remote from me, I can see a situation in the future where I'll be able to monitor those patients by way of electronic telemedicine without uh, having to have them in my office and have a three hour drive just for me to feel their pulses or do a duplex on them in the office, which, you know, the, the recent situation with COVID pandemic has really brought forth the importance of quality telemedicine. And so the ability to get information that you can trust and is reproducible and predictable and accurate in patients that are not in your office, I think has tremendous uh, potential, especially for operators who do a lot of critical limb. Absolutely, that's a great point. Peter. I'll combine all those thoughts. Tissue perfusion is, is the golden goose, right? It's what we've, everything that we do is an attempt to learn more about tissue perfusion. It's true in the non-invasive lab with ABIs and TBIs and spectral Doppler and color Doppler. And, and the fact that we're finally able to understand and see clearly tissue perfusion, and that is, as John just mentioned, we can do it in such a straightforward way is gonna change everything. You know, it'll, it'll change, it'll impact our decision-making in the lab. It's probably gonna impact our, the way we study devices in the future. The ability to understand so simply and so easily what's happening at a tissue perfusion level with each intervention that we do is, is just the potential there for a dramatic impact on everything ranging from our interventions and severe PAD through you know, what goes on in a patient that's on levofed with, with septic shock. We just have so much to learn now that suddenly an easy mechanism of assessing um, repeatedly uh, tissue perfusion exists. So it's, it's just striking that we finally have what we've always wanted and needed, and we have it in such an easy way. Well, thank, well thanks to all of you gentlemen for joining us for today's symposium. I, I think those are great concluding remarks. I think we, for a long time, have wanted some, some means of real-time assessment of blood flow at the digital level. And I think with FlowMet, we've finally gotten it. And it's been great to hear how each of you are using this in your practices already and in such a breadth of patients that are out there who clearly can benefit from this technology. So I wanna thank each of you for, for participating tonight and certainly Medtronic for graciously sponsoring all of this today so that we can learn more about this new technology. Thank you all for your attention.